have a couple of uh, announcements to make. And, uh, I'm going to make the first announcement is that um, because of a change in who was appointed by the City of Sacramento, our, uh, uh, our chair is no longer a member of the commission. Um, and uh, then because the vice chair is in the town, uh, okay. uh, it's, uh, I guess I'm chair emeritus for the day. So uh, we'll begin the meeting by uh, trying to explain to those of you who were here for the election why I'm still here. <laughs> So this meeting is being videotaped in its entirety. It will be uh, cable cast without interruption on Metro Cable 14, uh, the government's first channel on the Comcast cable system. And today's meeting is going out live and then will be repeated on Saturday, April 3rd at noon on Channel 14. And the VHS copy is also available for checkout from uh, any of the library branches and I don't know if it's quicker than the Board of Supervisors ones get there, but a bit of a lag. Um, now, members of the uh, audience who are with us today and wishing to address the board on any item that's on our agenda uh, need to fill out a speaker identification form. Uh, and those are in the back uh, of the room and then give that to the uh, clerk of the board so that or the commission so that we will know you wish to speak. And uh, as each of you come forward um, to speak, I know you've already filled out the form, and I've probably called your name, but you also need to repeat your name, because besides being videotaped, these meetings are also audio taped, and so we need a name when you, uh, when you give us, uh, when you come forward. Okay, with that, uh, we're going to have the clerk call the roll. Kurt? Here. Gora? Natale? Here. Dickinson? Here. Fargo? Here. Nilo? Here. Shelby? Jones? Colin? Here. And we have Mr. Yi sitting in. Here. Mr. Yi is the vice mayor and uh, is sitting in today. <coughs> and we have um, item number one, community programming grantee agreements, policy workshop continued. Okay. Mr. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for Agreeing to uh, chair Mrs. Collin and <laughs> welcome Ms. Fargo. Uh, this is a continuation from our March meeting, which was a workshop to discuss your community programming grantees as uh, grantee agreements. I'll do a brief background without going through the presentation from, from last month. The uh, packet before you is the same as last month. You have, you own seven channels on the cable system for community programming and you lease six of those. You retain and operate the one we're cable casting on now, channel 14, uh, uh, as your own operating entity. The other six are leased out, uh, putting that word in quotes, to community programming entities which program them for you. The administrative vehicle for your oversight and the basis upon which we provide funding to those grantees is a grantee agreement, a channel use agreement. It's included as an attachment in your, in your packet from last time. We have given those agreements a three-year life, and the agreements now are up for renewal this July. Three years ago, we renewed the existing agreements from three years before. So these agreements have not had your oversight or your look at them for, for six years. So staff raised at the last meeting some policy questions, trying to narrow from all of the policy questions in the world to a few that we thought were, were relevant because of changes that have been made to the agreements by amendment over time, or issues that have been raised by the community programming entities recently regarding uh, their operations and, and role. I, we divided those into uh, three or four main topics at the last meeting and presented those, and you had begun a discussion, the objective of which was to give staff direction and council direction to prepare new language and new agreements with any changes you may have for your review and approval at the, at the June meeting. You got into that, that discussion, um, didn't complete it, and asked for additional time. And so in March, you, you said you would continue the workshop at this meeting. You also asked staff to arrange for a continuation meeting should you need more time. And we, we that was in part because uh, the regularly scheduled May meeting Again, your meetings are normally scheduled first Thursday of the month at 2.30, conflicts with the cap-to-cap -cap trip. 
So we, we slid and have on all your schedules, I believe including now even the new members, uh, a May 13th, 9.30 backup meeting. With that, I, I can go into more depth on the questions if you like, or uh, if you were sufficiently briefed or recall the conversation and the discussions you had from, from early March, then you can get into or, or proceed through the, the, uh, the topics in the question, in the order that they were presented, or in any order that you're comfortable with. Ms. Fargo is, is perplexed, I'm sure this is coming at some <laughs> things right off the, right fresh, I mean, from, from yesterday. Um, as background, uh, let me just take one of the, one of the topics and, and see if I can brief you on it um, as, we, as we go through. Program underwriting is, is the way it's the, it's the nice words about corporate and other public sponsors that, are, that is added to community programming. Uh, the best example is, is that which you see on, on PBS. Your rules essentially emulate the PBS rules for program underwriting and it provides authority for your community programming grantees to secure underwriting, which means, which usually means revenue to them by inserting uh, structured announcements within and at the end of, of uh, programming on, on your channels. Uh, it's here, it's, it's something that you have amended and tuned twice in the last three years to change the structure. You, you set it up, it used to be that the that the uh, underwritings had to be at the beginning and the end of a program and you changed that to accommodate sports program and delegated to your community programming grantees um, the decision making to put the, the underwritings in, uh, in natural breaks. You deemed that reasonable and made those, made those changes. I report to you that the program underwritings seem to have been working. There haven't been any complaints of, of excessive underwritings on your community programming channels and that was, was described here. So the, the question to staff was, is, you know, knowing what you know, hopefully being, being uh, viewers of your own community programming channels, is, are there any, is there any staff direction to change the language on program underwritings? Anyone feel like tackling this one? <laughs> In terms of the workshop format, so if you want to question or not, but I think that's a good format to use, Rich, with a, we have new members and we just might want to do one after another like that. I, for one, am comfortable with, uh, with the underwriting uh, process that we have. I think it pretty much mirrors what, uh, what Channel 6 is using, and does it not? And, uh, um, and it helps bring in money to the, uh, uh, the uh, channel operators. So I don't know if anyone else has any problems with underwriting. I don't think that was a major concern. Okay. No. Want to go to the second one then? If you want to go in order, or we can take the one that seemed to get your attention and get focus on from the last meeting. And if with your permission, let's let's jump to the one that that seemed to have some concern or, or okay. uh, some need to talk. And I believe Thanks for that. Being too quiet. Yeah, <laughs> it's going too well. <laughs> Um, There's uh, a blessing in that, you know. <laughs> Ron and Access Sacramento have, pr have provided some additional language or some suggested language for your discussion that's there in front of you. Let's jump to the, uh, the question on telethons. Right now, telethons are restricted on your community programming channels to telethons for the benefit of your community programming grantee. At, at the last meeting, Access Sacramento asked for permission to conduct telethons specifically for the Red Cross and there was expressed some concern primarily by legal counsel that a, a policy decision on your part that allowed a single entity access to telethons uh, might have some, some legal discrimination problems. And, and we had an expression from a couple of you with some concerns about that, and then since then, Access Sacramento has provided new language in front of you and some criteria they'd like you to, you to consider regarding external telethons. That is, these telethons would be ones that would be for fundraising purposes for outside entities on your community programming channels. And that's one that seemed to have some, it woke you up a little bit. So I would suggest <laughs> and that maybe we take that one next as it, as it would help us get your, uh, a sense of direction from you in, in drafting the agreements. Yeah, and I, 
for the benefit of the new members, I, I don't think I was the only one, but I, I do remember being one that really questions telethons in, in, in terms of for other than the benefit of the grantees themselves, um, particularly um, they do eat up a tremendous amount of programming time, have the potential to do that, and it's very difficult to say what one emergency is and and isn't, and I think if you do it for one group, it's very hard to say you can't do it for another under equal access. So those are some of the concerns that I, I remember expressing. It, what, what troubles me about it, just thinking about what could happen is, I mean, this sounds somewhat simplistic, but these things will either be a success or they won't be. If they're not a success, then the problem will answer itself and we won't have any requests for telethons. It goes away. But if it's successful, I'll guarantee you we'll have requests for far more than four a year. And how are we going to decide who doesn't get it? Who doesn't get access to the, to the telethon? Roger, are you, are you uh, referring to non-emergency type telethons? Well, if we have a problem with defining what an emergency is. Well, that's another question I have. Yeah. Is there a definition of emergency? And, and I would say the question would be the same regardless. I, I think that the definition of what an emergency is can be rationalized based upon one's connection with the supposed emergency. Uh, and then secondly, I just if it's successful, um, there are going to be more. I just have to believe there are going to be more than four requests a year if it's successful. And, and it's going to be very difficult to, to pick and choose among worthy causes. Uh, uh, that concern. Jimmy? Yeah, I, I, I have similar concerns about Rogers is that telethons for emergency purposes, such as a, a flood somewhere in, say, the Red Cross asking for, for uh, fundraising is one thing, but uh, for non-emergency type telethon, I, I do have some real concerns for it. And uh, like Roger says, where do you stop? Because I, I know there's every non-profitable or non-profit type organization would love to have fundraisers, telethons. And I don't know where I'm gonna, I could put my foot down and say, you can have it and you can't. It's one of those things. And, I don't know that we want this commission to be put on that position. Or, or your emergency is not an emergency. <laughs> um, and yours is. I, well, the, the policy issue would be actually we'd be, we'd be giving to the grantees the ability to do that under a definition now as a policy we would adopt. So we wouldn't be actually doing it uh, the grantees would, um, and, and you know, it seems to me if you're looking at emergency and limiting the amount, um, you could still run into, you know, how, how to craft those definitions. But um, yep, yeah. I guess I mean, just um, thinking this thing through a little bit, that um, is there any ability to um, for the grantees to? Uh, acknowledging that there could be an emergency a week, I guess, but I think this, you know, I think prudence and um, and good judgment would be a part of this. I mean, it's not written in the, in, in the guidelines here, but I think as, as outlined, uh, would be a lot of thought that goes into it. But rather than getting into any sort of determination beyond what criteria might be set if we were to embark on this, would it be uh, reasonable to basically limit it to one? No more than one a year, or something like that. I mean, basically, that I mean, they would they would pick and choose, uh, so to speak, uh, in the event that they wanted to, you know, pursue a telethon of sorts. Because otherwise, I, I do think that the issues are raised here. If you can meet all those criteria, you could have programming uh, for telethons to go on, you know, fairly uh, consistently. Uh, uh, and I think to the detriment of having actual programming available that the channels were designed to do. And, and I think it's, these are worthwhile pursuits. But at least in my mind, maybe there's the ability to actually have a limitation relative to the actual uh, telethon events themselves and, and do it in a fairly uh, tight number, but one that would still allow this opportunity should the grantees, uh, whoever they might be, in this case it's access, but there were maybe others on some of the other channels that would uh, wish to do it as well. So I guess I'm, I'm open to the, to the 
uh, thought here. Uh, I think that the, the one that was uh, brought forth um, uh, that was done this last time around uh, was done for, you know, seven hours and it wasn't an extreme amount of time on these 24, 48-hour telethons. On the other hand, uh, they, I think it was good judgment in, in who they were assisting here. But So I would be open to an idea that we might have some extra limitations uh, on num in, a, in a physical number as well. So that's my thoughts. Okay, Rob. Thanks. <clears throat> I'm wondering how actually we define a telethon. Do we have a, a good definition of what one is? And, and this is what I'm wondering about is if we, you know, the example that we've seen displayed here was the emergency in Central America with the natural disaster. And we had a sort of an ongoing news story about that and its impacts on the folks there. And occasionally, um, the Red Cross phone number is given out. Does that constitute a telethon? Or is a telethon when you actually say, you know, operators are standing by, call us here today, and maybe you could explain that a little bit. <laughs> now, somebody, Two things. Somebody says, My, well, here's the number, and you can show their phone number no more than once every 15 minutes. Is that a telethon, or? <laughs> don't know. I, I'm going to duck that one. Sir. <laughs> I, I, Access Sacramento is the proponent of this language, and they presented that's what this attachment. Uh, I saw under, that. Yeah, yeah and that, that came in yesterday, and it's, it's you. So I would request that you direct that question to Ron uh, or to the Access folks that are, that are here and let them define that for you. And my definition, I think a, a focused programming event with Ongoing and continuous pledge or well, request on, for money I, I, is a is a is a telethon. A uh, um, I think we see now on the religious channel there's a, you know, a call for more information number. I don't think that's necessarily a telethon, although I tested a few and if you wanted to send dollars, that's okay. Um, but I, I, I a telethon <laughs> would be something quite focused and very much uh, revenue oriented. We haven't attempted to try to define what a telethon was um, until at least we had these discussions. You know, in the past, you've had the ability in your agreements to have fundraising telethon type activities for to raise money for um, for the stations themselves, and um, that's as far as we've gotten at this point in the discussion. So we haven't tried to come up with any kind of ironclad definitions no, or even and, unironclad definitions. And it seems to right me like it would, it would be fairly tough to <laughs> finally hone in on that. But and I'm not I'm not sure exactly where the line is where you, you go from simply supplying information to folks who would like to make contributions to relief to a disaster or an emergency to where you you then are Sort of petitioning them for money, and there's a difference there. And as we get more and more toward the petition end, I have a harder and harder time with it. Okay, Heather. I guess I just have a couple of questions on this. When we talk about telephoning on our TV stations, cable access TV stations, um, I didn't see in the staff report a suggestion on the the length of time that we would allow that to take place or on whether or not percentage of what was raised or whether or not the fee charged for that kind of fundraising. It seems to me there are some questions along that line that I was curious about. In the, work for, in the workshop structure, staff went the other way and said, what are your thoughts on those issues? We did raise some in the, in the staff report about frequency, duration, um, uh, local of the entity as possible areas where if you were interested in pursuing or authorizing telethons, you might want to put some limitations. Um, I don't know that we addressed or suggested uh, a time length, but we did suggest that we thought appropriate that there be a frequency, a right, how number length. Uh, we also thought that it should be a certified nonprofit. Um, and we, we did raise those on, on page four or five of the staff report last time, but staff didn't go we didn't go at this to develop a policy and recommend it to you. The idea of the workshop was to see if you, in fact, wanted us to move forward on, on that. But those are all factors that could be framed within some, some scope of having a telethon and then 
limiting or setting limits or parameters. You know, I have to admit, watching telethons is not one of my favorite things. So, um, but then again, there are a lot of things on every station that people choose to watch or not choose to watch, and that's part of part of the point, I guess, is to have a lot of those options. But um, it seems to me that that what we want to define is a public benefit, while at the same time as reducing the public irritation. Um, so if there is a public benefit that somehow benefits the cable commission or people's access, then maybe there's a rationale for doing it. Um, and I don't know, do other, I don't even know what cable entities throughout the United States do this? Is, is, is there other, are there other entities that have public policy in this regard that have already had this debate and decided telethons under these circumstances are allowable and these aren't? Ron, are you aware of other entities, other public access entities that have telephone policy? I guess I could see us getting into a situation where we could have even, in some cases, you know, battling telephones where people on one end or another, both nonprofits of any particular issue, might choose to have their fundraisers. It's, just, it's an interesting issue that I hadn't really thought about. Um, I guess I'm not. It puts us in a position of saying which nonprofits are in fact benefiting the public more than others, and which ones we want to support versus those we don't. It's an interesting. Well, I think the bigger issue too is a is a bigger policy issue is that what were public access stations created for? And I mean that's the underlying thing that I have struggles with is, uh, you know, it seems to me that they were created um, uh, to give um, the public access to programming. And the whole idea behind this franchise and the leasing out of the cam channels at one time was that there would be programming on them. Uh, we would love some local programming on them. Uh, uh, over the years, we've we've looked at many different proposals, but it would seem that telephones are something that could be handled extremely well by commercial stations. And why would you want to do them on public access stations? Um, I, for one, I think, for instance, the ed educational channel is so heavily programmed, they would probably never get into it. Uh, and they probably could stand a second channel uh, with the, with that, uh, at the rate that they're programming and all the schools are responsible for. Um, channel 6, as far as I know, on their channel 7, on the, this lease channel, uh, d does nothing in terms of, uh, of any fundraising. Um, and uh, they're, they're free to do the underwriting. And so you get back to, you know, the, the public access. And uh, actually, we've got two public access channels. And I guess I'm raising the question with two public access channels. If you're going to use one for telethons, uh, you know, maybe we should have been using it for the Ed Consortium instead. Uh, and I just, those are the kind of thoughts that run through my mind. And I have to be real frank about it, that, um, uh, yeah. no. yeah, this, Ms. Fargo, two things to clarify. There's, there's nothing in the proposal as presented by Access that has any direct benefit monetarily to the Cable Commission. That's why a discussion on external telethons. There is existing authority to run telethons, internal telethons, or telethons for the benefit of the community programming grantee. Um, if you apply the, you don't have a grantee operating agreement with yourself, but you under if you apply those policies to channel 14, you could do a telethon for channel 14 on channel 14. This policy is for external telethon. Yeah. Um, this is for external, this is for external telethons. Well, and does it raise the question also of the religious telethons? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, but I, we have we have not differentiated as to the rules under which the channels operate between the different thought. channels. Um, your relig the religious channel gets no funding from the commission, other than the, having the channel itself. The Ed Consortium and Access um, and KBIE get funding from the commission in addition to the channel, but all of them have um, virtually identical um, grant agreements. And so we haven't, we really haven't tried to differentiate between different types of fundraising. 
right now what happens is basically we have sort of the general rubric of commercial purposes and fundraising. We don't really, in the actual documents, we don't use the words like telephones, but um, as to those types of things, they're allowed to have um, the corporate sponsors, you know, the, the um, identifications, and they're allowed to have um, fundraising activities that benefit the station itself. Those are the only two areas where they're allowed to have money coming in, so to speak, other than, you know, pure donations. Um, and so this is one of those issues where it would sort of Ra open the door to more fundraising activity, and it would be fundraising activity that benefits somebody, you know, an entity other than the it's station itself. Yeah. External. Okay. Any other board members want to express themselves at this point on this issue? I, I guess I just raise the uh, the general point of, uh, particularly when uh, Harriet was saying what what she was saying just then. What is it that we wish to do? It gets sort of to the mission of the thing. Is the point that we want to uh, provide uh, fundraising ability or fundraising resources to community charitable organizations or disasters as we define them? Could be there's a better way to do that uh, as opposed to um, telethons per se. Maybe it begs a, a broader question. Um, and, and that perhaps complicates our, our the issue that it, that's at hand, and I don't mean to do that, but it, it might raise a, a broader question. But it's just the, the tough thing about it is there's so many worthy causes, and gosh, if we could, if it could be successful, and we could donate five channels to it, I think we'd all love it. But we're we're dealing with a limited resource, and making those decisions can be very difficult. If it's successful, of course. And I guess that's the same policy issue that I was getting at. That if the mission of uh, was supposed to be programming on these channels for community programming. And then we're really entertaining a modification of that, I suspect. A big one as far as I'm concerned. But okay. Well, we're going to call on people to speak afterwards, but we're going to run down these issues. Okay. Because so okay. we're taking no decision making today. Right. The, and what staff is looking for is a, a sense of what you'd like to see in the documents subject to your final approval and if you'd like to ask staff to develop alternate language for you at the, to, to, to decide on later, that's, that's fine. Another issue that, that we'll come back to or, or we'll, we'll tie to um, is one also raised by Access Sacramento. It has to do with the exchange of programming and this is, I see this as a two-part question. Um, Access believes that it's, that it's a and then, Ron, if I phrase this wrong, then jump in and, and, and help me here. Um, that exchanging programming with a commercial entity is a policy that you should support because it gives additional exposure to the programming of both parties. And Access Sacramento believes that that authority is currently, can currently be interpreted in, in the existing documents. Uh, your counsel, or I shouldn't speak for Harriet, but it's my belief that that is not explicitly clear and it's not something that you have explicitly discussed in this forum before. So the first issue is that, is that, that there should there be a, a, a provision, a policy that, that your grantee board can decide that there was equity, a, a quid pro that they're comfortable with, to exchange programming that has been produced under your auspices by them with a commercial entity. If you recall last month, and he may be here or not, but the gentleman from, from uh, one of the low power, uh, Channel 25 was here, and, and he, he supported that and also took you to the, to the next level, which was that if your policy is such that making a programming exchange or delegating authority to your grantee board to make a programming exchange is acceptable to you, should the commercial entity, having made that fair and equitable exchange, not commercials? For its benefit, its sole benefit, in the in on its station, with the programming that was traded. So it's a it's a two part. Um, need to go around again. <laughs> okay, I try to keep that consistent. Just... Uh, you know, another one that that staff would would like to have you say to us clearly that programming exchanges are delegated to your 
board and that's what you like and that's what you want and we'll make sure the, the grantee agreement language reflects that clearly. Uh, right now, we, we, we're we unclear as to if that's your policy or not. Yeah, and that, that got us into the issue, the copyright issue too. In part, yes. And I believe Access has addressed some of that in documentation to you, or in, in the, some of the material that was presented to you last month. They talked about how they do control, how there is control on the copyright side. Right now, the copyrights mm -hmm. on the programming produced at the Access Studios, as I understand it, is held jointly both by Access and by the person who actually produced the show. And so, if Access wanted to exchange that program um, for other programming, they would need both their own permission and the permission of the, pers the producer who holds the copyright. And the reason that this wasn't adopted when the when the um, when we first started the the cable business was because of the objections of people who produce programming uh, without uh, this type of funding, and they <coughs> produce the programming and then try to get it on to commercial stations, and they would see this as a potential um, inroad into their business. Uh, and, um, and and I, I really and truly don't know. I, I, I assume from that standpoint, maybe they'd think that this is what is the thing, the nose of the camel under the tent, uh, if we start doing this. Um, because I, and, and I, I, my initial reaction is I, I, I've never had much of a problem with doing it if you can figure out how to do it within guidelines that would work. But um, I'm not sure how far down that slippery slope you get. But I knew it was hotly debated that when the franchise was first put together that they did not think since these were monies that were generated um, and then the grantees had this money that if they were then, because um, it came from cable subscribers, that that could put them into competition with viewers, uh, with, uh, with commercial filmers who didn't have access to that kind of money or that kind of resource. I don't know whether we want to make a change on that or not. It seemed like it's that big an issue. Is, is it? It was. It was a big issue at the beginning of the franchise, and I think that was because of the where the source of the money came from, and that they were precluded from that. They couldn't just go. With, they they couldn't be a part of learning the. Um, you know, in other words, getting money from access. And I reported to you last month that I thought the magnitude was an issue as well. When we started this process in the early 80s, um, and compared to where we are now, uh, more money would be going into community programming now under the original franchise agreement than the commission <coughs> receives in total now. So there was concern that, that as we look forward, 10 or 15 years out, that there would be $3 million or better a year in community programming rather than something that's about half that now. And so that the, the magnitude, I think, raised the level of concern with the community producers who help uh, lobby these, these provisions in on, on commercial use and I mean, I just don't really know whether it's that big a concern now and whether we could really work something out that would work. I think the type of being put forward by access that you're all familiar with had to do with sports, did it not? Sports programming. And uh, they were able through community programming to do taping of some, pro of, of some sports that the commercial station simply couldn't <coughs> do. So. The historical perspective is interesting. Uh, that, that there was probably an honest concern then it doesn't seem like it played out that direction. Yeah. And, uh, That's because it's never happened. But now this is the first time we've been asked to do something. Yeah. yeah. Is there a way we could try it for a year and or three and see how it works? You, you know, you, if we exchange some high school football games, it's not going to be the end of the world. I don't think the I, I, producers are going to be too upset. That then that's that's the venue in which it was brought to yeah. us and. You know, and again, I think that those are legitimate programs on community programming to me too, because they they're an interest that's local. Um, 
that approach to uh, right now in the program underwriting policies you, you took and we're rec <coughs> not recommending, but in the stage now of, of continuing those, which was to let's test a policy. Let's, let's take something that, that, that seems like it's okay. Let's try it for a year or two years or a number of events. Uh, plug in some reporting mechanism back to you, and if no red flag surface, let the policy continue. Um, but set up a, a review mechanism for you. And that, that practice may be one that fits well in, on this issue, or in, on any of these issues, in fact. Um, Madam Chair, uh, yeah. it, being new to the process, I'm not privy to the history, and uh, I don't know the specific uh, request that might have come forward. But again, getting back to the mission of the organization and that which it, that, it, that is what we're tr getting back to what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, my understanding is it's local programming, local programming of a, particularly of a type that is not available on commercial television. Mm -hmm. And if we are providing that service actually on commercial television stations, then it would seem to me that's consistent with our mission. That is to say local uh, high school sports programming that perhaps they can't uh, produce and for some reason through the uh, access uh, uh, program and volunteer base, it, it can be produced, then it's providing local programming that can't be provided otherwise. It would seem to be consistent with the mission. A similar question I was raising when we were talking about the uh, telethon issue. Maybe if we go back to the mission and ask that question and how consistent is this question with regard to our mission, it might provide us with the answer. I think I, I don't hear, hear anyone saying that they've got major objections to trying to test it out, try it out. Um, and as I said, we'll we'll take all your comments from everyone who's signing up at the, at the end. So this is just a workshop. So okay, you got another question left? Let's just take the other part of this one um, and then clarify it. Yeah. If I'm hearing Mr. <laughs> Mr. Nilo, that it's consistent with the mission to expand the playback opportunities of programming produced with your dollars. Should the commercial entity, a profit-making business entity, be allowed to run advertisements for its benefit on programming produced with your dollars? In what way could that be made consistent with our mission? That was a question I was thought I was posing. Yeah. Uh, yes. Is that consistent with our, with our mission? Well, I think what you're saying is can they share the, could they share some of that commercial profit? Exactly. Yeah. If they could uh, add to our resources to further um, accomplish our mission, then it's consistent with the mission. I was going to facetiously say maybe we sell programming to the commercial stations and uh, give that money to the people who would like to do telethons. Uh, <laughs> but again, um, if we make these things consistent with the mission of the organization, maybe the answers are a little bit easier to find. And, and if the commercial entity shared with uh, our organization uh, whatever they're profiting by virtue of using our programming, we could utilize that to, to uh, enhance our resources to then further accomplish our mission. Help us if the, the hearing the, the direction that you're going in, if a shared revenue from a commercial producer or playback, a commercial broadcaster, uh, if that factor eliminated the opportunity to run the programming, which if I heard the gentleman last month, that's what he was saying. There's on our own station? On his station. That, that, he, that the quid pro, that the trade of the programming between the two entities wouldn't occur if he had to, uh, one, if that entity couldn't run advertising because it's a for-profit business, or two, if it had to share. Uh, is well, it, is well it the your... second point is a point of negotiation, I think. I understand the first point, okay. but I think the second point is probably more an issue of negotiation. Do you want that delegated to your grantee board? I'm just suggesting an approach. Okay. I'm not providing answers. I just think we need to go back to what the mission of the organization is. Yeah. And I think that this is one where you might want to come forward with some, some options to look at. Because I, I don't think any of us have thought through how that could, how that could yeah, it, it can be a very slippery slope. I, I understand that, but I'm just talking about the general approach. Um, I, I don't know if this will be helpful or not, and you know, 
others are free to disagree because I came in through this late as well. But in reading through the grantee agreement, uh, it seemed to me when I was reviewing this when the issue of exchanging the um, sporting event programming came up that um, one of the policies behind the way that they were written right that they're written right now is that since there's public money going to support the channels that no one should be making a profit so to speak from that public money and so that it comes so, so you see in the agreement the prohibition against using the resources that they get either through equipment or through programming or the like for commercial purposes you know, unless it falls within several very limited exceptions. And so I think if you look at, um, you know, in what one way of viewing the existing agreements is that because they receive public money, that public money shouldn't be turned into a commercial, you know, t for the benefit of a commercial organization. There are other policies with respect to um, public programming, of course, and public dollars going into public programming, some of which uh, Mr. Lilo just uh, talked about, such as getting the programming out, having more people see it, um, you know, those types of things. So I think that, you know, uh, one of the things you might like to see at, at some point is sort of an enunciation of some of the different types of policies, or you might, you know, ask your grantees to look at some of the reasons, you know, what, their, what they view their mission and whether these things fit within those missions. Okay, Rob, did you still want to uh, add? I think most of the, my concerns have been raised. It's, uh, I, I think it would be awfully tough to establish what the profit from the grantee programming on the for-profit station actually was. And, you know, that would be beyond, frankly, our ability to audit. So I'm not sure how to do that. Earlier on, it seemed fairly simple that we were exchanging programming for programming, and if the grantees thought they were getting a, a raw deal, they just wouldn't, wouldn't agree it. to it and, and walk away. Um, so there'd be some mutuality to the exchange there. I hadn't really thought through then what happens to the grantee programming on the commercial station. I, I'm assuming they're going to sell ads and, and pay their overhead, and of course, we were auditing it, they would never make a profit on grantee programming. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that once you add money into the equation, rather than just the exchange of programming, that it, it, uh, it's any easier to figure out. Okay, well, we'll, I, we'll hear more about Yeah, on the, the, the <laughs> notion, though, I, this is in some ways something I'd just like to leave up to the grantee boards to figure out. It's, of their programming, they know what their viewers are going to watch, and they know what it takes to broaden the exposure. They definitely ought to get credit for the programming on the commercial stations, though. Thanks. Okay. All right. Next item. Are there one or two more? But the last item was raised by the religious coalition, and it's one I think we can abbreviate for today's discussion. This was the, the, the issue of using the revenues provided by the religious coalition from their playback service for broader purposes of the Interfaith Service Bureau. I, the perspective I have on, on this, and I'm making somewhat of a recommendation, but I think you can address this at, within the grant agreement for the religious coalition that, that their budget proposal should come to you with some specifics of what they have in mind, and you can address their question at that time. I don't believe it to be a necessarily a grantee operating agreement, oversight um, agreement issue. So I um, had a brief, brief conversation with uh, Mr. McNamara, who is the executive director of the Interface Service Bureau. Uh, after your last meeting and, and said, would that work for him? And I thought he'd be here today to say yes, it, yes, it did. So I think we can take this one out now and deal with it within the specifics of their budget, yeah, of their grant application. Because yeah, they're receiving, they're, they're, there's no money, oh. there's nothing else, it's, it's a channel lease. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we have a group of people that wish to be heard on the different issues before us and with 
you've heard some of the discussion today. Uh, Ron Cooper uh, is one of the speakers. And another speaker is uh, Kenneth Noel and uh, Sue Atkinson and Mike Barnbaum. The last okay. two were for item two. Oh, okay. Just so you know. Not on the agenda. Okay. I'm Ron Cooper, Executive Director of Access Sacramento, and given the workshop nature, uh, uh, Ms. Collin, I'd appreciate uh, there were many points raised today that I, I will be brief, but I would like to address uh, the many questions that were raised. Uh, one of the valuable insights that uh, some of you, and certainly for those who are new, your predecessors in forming the Cable Commission and administering it over these last uh, what, 13, 14 years now, uh, was the establishment of these organizations in effect as a buffer uh, to administer the different missions of each organization, the, act, the public access and community use channel of Access Sacramento and our board of directors, which is uh, uh, governed by bylaws, which has uh, election process from the membership, uh, which has monthly board meetings, which has extensive packets that are distributed to all of you, uh, to update you on our activities. I believe a very wise decision because, uh, for example, Ken Adams, our chair of our programming committee, is here today. Programming committee meets every single month and discusses many of the issues that you're talking about here, how best to provide stewardship of these resources to best benefit the entire community. Um, so I'm going to try to address the uh, first issue in terms of uh, the issue of fundraising and telethons and so forth and why we raised that whole question. Um, and, uh, and very specifically because I heard some uh, different comments uh, basically along the lines that we don't want this to get carried away uh, to please uh, refer to the uh, modified language that we're proposing as of today given the feedback that we've gotten from you and from staff in the past. Um, Jan Pillman was here last month and did mention that PBS, uh, while predominantly allows only telethons for the, ch uh, for the station's fundraising purposes, um, and that is an FCC guideline, the FCC also allows for exceptions, and that back during the San Francisco earthquake, uh, KBIE uh, appealed for such an exception and was granted that and did a fundraising telethon in that emergency situation. Uh, that's very similar to what we're proposing. The underwriting guidelines from day one have always been predicated on PBS style. And so that's uh, always been the case and is the case. Um, the issue in terms of what differentiates uh, 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 fundraising on the channel from other programming um, and why the guidelines are set up the way they are, um, it has to do in advertising terms with the call to action. And believe me, the board of directors, the programming committee, and as executive director, we address this issue daily, weekly, year after year. And I, I, appreciate, I appreciate this opportunity to give you some insights in terms of we're doing the work. We're doing the work so it doesn't come to you. Silence is golden in this instance. The fact that you don't have folks coming in after all these years protesting what we're doing over there, I would hope, is interpreted as doing a good job. That's what we're doing. Uh, and in this regard, a call to action is not allowed, whether it's for uh, auto dealership, whether it's for the Red Cross. You cannot go on our channels and say, send us money. You can't show dollar signs. Uh, you can say, uh, call this number for more information. Uh, you can do any, and, and that is a really black and white, real simple guideline. And that's the way it works, call to action. And that, uh, that pertains to nonprofit groups as well. The key thing I don't think that has been brought up is the experience that we had in November, and I really want to emphasize that. First off, commercial stations uh, are way away from telethons. They do an occasional telethon, they're doing less and less because they found that infomercials are far more valuable in those late night hours, and they're making lots of money, and they really, that time is precious. So what we're proposing here is we found that by going on television, where 70% of the households in our community turn first for information, we can help in very specific ways to identify for the audience key issues, crises, emergencies, and that was what was going on with Hurricane Mitch. It was a news story, and then it was gone. But there was thousands of people suffering, and it allowed the many voices in our community from those countries to come forward. 
That was what is different than what, what's been described so forth. It was a forum for the many uh, communities in Latin America to come forward to offer programming, talent, content, local uh, Hispanic uh, radio and TV personalities, uh, and uh, working with groups to solicit funds to help in that crisis or emergency situation. We're not inundated with these requests. We've been doing this now for 12 years. This is the first time that that came up. Um, and the guidelines that we've set into place with the modifications, again, are intending. We, we, we said six. We're saying only four. Programming Committee, Operations Committee, and the Board are three different groups that would buffer those requests before it ever surfaced anywhere near the Cable Commission. Um, and uh, crisis and emergency, I feel confident that we can define that. Uh, there has to be legitimate roots in this community, an IRS 501c3 standing and three years of office in our county. Um, there must be local support, as the Hispanic communities have said. Uh, Access Sacramento does not have the resources to do telethon. Uh, we need content. Think about it. It's just a production tool. It's a delivery system. But the content has to be supplied by somebody. So there has to be that kind of support. And of course, reporting back to you in terms of what the four are and how successful they were. Um, are there any questions about the intent that we're having we're putting forth here in terms of fundraising events on the channel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jimmy? Quick question there, Ron. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that uh, looking back over the years that this Red Cross thing was essentially the only one that's come up. Uh, how did you arrive at four events as the recommendation? Uh, the issue is uh, from a, really from a production standpoint. Uh, to devote channels, and I think Ms. Collin pointed that out. We do not want the channels inundated with fundraising events and telethons. That has been clear from day one in everything that we've written. I, I heard um, that, but going and, from one over to all these years to go to four per year. It's, no, no, I'm not, and again, it's no more than four. I understand so, that, but how did you arrive at no more than four? Why not no more than two or no more than three? <laughs> Uh, it's a production process. Uh, we were thinking no more than six, and then the guidelines perhaps would be no more than once every two months. Uh, the guidelines may in fact say no more than one per quarter in terms of four, four per year. Again, the language here is seeking direction in terms of our agreement, but then the programming committee and the other committees of the board would set up the specific guidelines. So for example, the four could easily be one per quarter. And that's a, that's a production and channel use type of uh, restriction so that we're not in, inundated uh, and uh, that that would uh, make sure that the resources are, uh, uh, we're providing proper stewardship so that we're not overwhelmed with one long telethon after another. I mean, if that's Space them out over the year. If that's how you arrive at it, could all, it could just as well be one every six months then. Absolutely. We're, we're just offering an opportunity to bring television focus to local crisis and emergency. And, and sometimes that's the flood of the American River, but sometimes it's families locally because the tragedy's far away. And we see it in little news clips, not what happened in our studios that night. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a profound uh, a calling out from local folks from Nicaragua and Guatemala and El Salvador and the other countries saying, help us, our families are in trouble, and, and this is that opportunity to give, and this is the phone number to call. Don? Yeah, I just, just want to follow on the question, uh, Ron, that, that Rich kind of threw to you when we were talking about this earlier in the, in the board workshop portion of it, and that is, is that you cited that PBS was given a waiver on the San Francisco earthquake, but what is the um, and I'm not going to say norm, but what's the experience elsewhere throughout the nation? I didn't, that wasn't really clear cut. You just kind of answered from your seat there. I'm curious as to, you know, and I'm sure there's probably a broad range, but is this something that's done quite frequently or is it infrequent uh, or is, is it scattered? I'm just, I'm curious as to, you know, what, what happens throughout the nation and other public access channels relative to this type of activity? I'm going to toot my own horn now in terms of Access Sacramento and the operation that we run. We are extremely vigilant in this area, both inviting involvement from the community, inviting the involvement of small businesses, and having very clear-cut guidelines of what that involvement is. And when you cross the line, that's not allowed. 
Uh, and we're leaders in the country as far as other access operations in this regard. Uh, in this particular example, uh, this is venturing into ground, which is the discussion today. This is something new and different. Uh, we, we, we've taken pride over the years in terms of defining new ground, and this is something that I, I think other access centers could look at and decide whether locally that would work for them or not. The key theme here is local folks appealing to their neighbors to help out in immediate situations that you can see right here, but also elsewhere in the world. Social service agencies are really strapped right now in terms of how to address the many international concerns as well as uh, issues. And those folks and their families live here. Okay, no, I, I understand that you've been very clear, and I, I recognize your leadership as well. I guess I'm still I want to go back to a question though: Is that what about is this type of programming done, or is it just it's just not done? It's just not saying? done. Okay, th th right. that, that that's the answer I was looking for. So it's, it's not. So that 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 answers it clearly to me. Then, then yeah. as far as I know, uh, yeah. this this proposal is unique to Sacramento County. It, it, the proposal, but what about telethon? So other other local programming access channels are not doing this type of programming where they put a telethon on on public access? There are telethons as similar as Harriet described in our guidelines to raise money for the channel itself. Right, okay. And those are the parameters. That's the, and so it's more, in, it, it's internally focused versus the external. Okay. Exactly. Thanks. Yes. Okay, now I, I assume <coughs> that you wanted to talk a little bit about the exchange of programming yes, too. Yes, so and I will be Be brief. mindful of the time. Yes, thank you. Um, the, uh, the commercial guidelines are really simple. When you watch television, there's plenty of commercial speech. We don't need more commercial speech, right? I mean, there's plenty of opportunities. And to go down the guidelines, uh, we don't allow commercial speech, and the reason why we encourage uh, General Manager Bob Supple of Low Power TV 25 to bring that issue to you, because the issue of exchanging Sac State basketball for local high school basketball with no commercials in either channel again, is, is just a marketing opportunity exposing our programming to another audience that doesn't get cable and vice versa. Uh, but he wanted to put commercials in that uh, high school prep football that we were giving them. That was novel, unique, different, and uh, we wanted to bring it to your attention before proceeding. Uh, we did feel confident that just simply the exchange, the rule is commercials shall not touch access to Sacramento produced programming. Obviously not on our channels, but for example, even in a news program, if there was footage shot, local news says, could we have a piece of that footage? The understanding, and I get it in writing, is we will not put any commercial touching, let alone interrupting any content from Access Sacramento and credit be given to Access Sacramento's producer for, for creating that program. Uh, the, um, was that, uh, excuse me, yes. and, and, and that takes away the issue of commercials then? Commercials on our channels, on your channel. Yes. Yeah. But when, but when um, they take the program from you, what type of? Um... Right now, we don't allow it. We didn't allow Channel 25, and that's why we brought it to your attention because of his request to. I need to recoup my money for doing my basketball games. Can I run a series of basketball games and not only commercials in Sac State that TV 25 produced, but also put those same commercials in the game of the week that we would provide. And that was new and different, and that's why we came before you to seek your guidance. Uh, honestly, um, I, I have mixed feelings. I mean, I can make a case either way. Um, I think that the quid quo exchange of programming, I think, works in, in, in many ways that would really be helpful. We've had inquiries, for example, from a prominent radio station. We're working with the sheriff's department to do programming. Well, the radio would like just the audio of that, and it's a commercial radio station. Um, right now, what I would say to them, we would love it, but would you be willing to run it without any commercials involved, either touching on the front or back or inserting anywhere in the middle? That would be the direction that I would, that would, I would expect. Um, uh, and I, ha again, have mixed feelings in terms of then using that programming to insert their own commercials. Um, I, my tendency is to say no to that. Um, and the reason is that it's a slippery slope. Um, at, and again, the administering of these resources day to day, um, one of the things that I have to really, really watch dog is once you go down the path of commercial consideration, uh, for those of you who are business people, how much is too much? 
if you're generating revenue via a commercial mechanism of any kind, oh, that's all the money we need. Sorry, don't need any more. We're not going to do that. Also, the criteria then becomes, well, we could do a wonderful program for the Hmong people. We have several radio programs and an occasional TV show from the Hmong community. Okay, we could do that. Well, wait a minute. The Hmong community wants to use the studio at a time where there's a paying client. Somebody wants to give us money to use that studio. Now, which one do we, which one do we choose? Do we choose to help the Hmong community as we do and have done? Or do we say, well, could you put that off because we have a paying client that's willing to, to use these resources? And so we always say no to that because there is plenty of opportunity if you've got money to hire production. And that, that goes back to the root issues that were raised in the early days of cable when myself stood before you, as well as other organizations and groups, and said the issue that we're trying to address is we don't want these community-funded resources to be used to create commercial projects, to create commercials for wine stocks, to create uh, for higher productions taking money away from the local small business production community. And we've adhered to that guideline. And again, no one's here saying different. No one's here saying, oh, they're stealing business from us. We don't do it. We don't allow it. And yet then serve the unserved, the people who don't have the money to buy commercial production and buy commercial time. That's the unserved population. The people that can buy time, plenty of opportunities, plenty of production facilities. Um, so just. Um, OK, is that about it? Uh, let's see. Not sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sure. We're running, we're we're running out of time. Does for any of the uh, access channels to sell their, the programming they produce? Can Liz sell her program? If somebody, somebody on a commercial station wanted to, to run, can Ron sell his program? Uh, not under your current agreements. They can exchange programming with other non-commercial stations. So if there was an ed station, let's say an access station in a different city. With other non-commercial stations. Right. They can't sell the program. And so, I mean, it, it, aren't you, isn't the basic uh, 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 transaction here a sale? The basic transaction would well, be If it's an exchange of programming, you get it. Sure. Well, are I you mean, saying exchange of programming is, is just another way to say a sale? Sure. It's consideration yeah. is just different than money. It happens, it happens yeah. to be um, something you, you can they, run. They can sell, I'm sorry, they, they can have transactions with other non-commercial television stations, and that may include both uh, exchange or it may include sale, but at, they cannot cross the line over to commercial stations and sell for commercial, sell their program right. to commercial. I'm just talking about commercial. So, so there's no authority to, to produce a program for Access Sacramento, even run it on Access Sacramento, and but sell it to uh, Channel Three. That's, that's, that's prohibited that's under your existing agreement. Okay, and so uh, what difference about a, a transaction of exchange of of programming with a with a commercial Oops. station? Well, let's let's clarify. Number one, if a commercial station wanted to utilize uh, a program or segments of a program produced by Access, etc., can they do that? with no consideration, with no money crossing hands, or no exchange either. Just, we want to use it. It was a great portion. We want to use it. It's, my opinion, it's tied to what the issue is now. I think Ron has defined it operationally well. I think he would let another commercial entity use it, but wouldn't let them put commercials in it. And that's been where you stopped your walk down the slippery slope. Um, the question, I think the bigger question is, in, in, in this example, and again, uh, Mr. Nilo, it's, it's like, what are we trying to accomplish? I think that's a relevant criteria. Is, is it, I asked the question, is it benefiting the commercial station even if it doesn't have an advertisement within it by giving, by providing the programming to the other, to the commercial entity, do they gain a commercial benefit? And as I read your, your language, it, it it isn't just the insertion of a commercial, it's commercial benefit, as, as I, we try to interpret the words from before. So I don't know if that gets at your, well, I, I, your I'm question. Still, I'm, I'm we're, step, we're still I'm confused. I'm step back from that, Rich. I'm, I'm <laughs> at, the, at the, the threshold issue, which is, can Access Sacramento produce a program and sell it for cash money? 
to a commercial station? No. No. Okay. And then what is the difference between that and selling a program for the consideration being in exchange, a program that can run on access? That's, that's why we're here. I mean, that's one of the reasons, that's Fine. the reason why we brought these issues to you. Do we want to because, change? Because you know, what, what, your grant <laughs> agreement, what your grant agreements say is that the resources... But I want to, I, I mean, I really want right. to know from your point of view, or your point of view, Ron, sure. what, what is the difference between those two, if any? Or are they, are they the same with only the, the same basic contractual transaction with only the consideration being different? Lawyers get hung up on things like this. <laughs> if I could take a first shot, then go. I, yeah. um, the, the discussion that went on over two months at our board, both at the committee level and at the board level, had to do with this very point. And that is, what is the difference? Well, the interpretation that we made, and that's why we're here, the interpretation that we made was on a case by case basis that the, see, one of the missing elements in all of this is local stations don't create local programming. Have you noticed that? Other than your news shows, it is too expensive for TV stations to do local programming. That's why no one does a pig bowl now but us. No one does extensive jazz jubilee but us and so forth. K TV 25 approached us, low power television. They were going to do Sac State basketball, which was beyond what we could do in just doing prep sports each week. So on that case for case analysis, our committees looked at that and said, yes, they're not paying us cash. There is isn't a quid pro quo exchange. In a legal term, I guess those could be interchangeable. But the issue here was TV25 is not on cable, so Comcast subscribers never see Sac State basketball produced by TV25 and vice versa. TV25 viewers probably don't take Comcast cable, never see prep game of the week. So that it seemed as though, even though it was a commercial entity, a small one, but a commercial one, that an exchange of programming, commercials not being shown on either channel, was a way of introducing local sports programming to both audiences. And in our case, the viewing audience of TV25, as we said, a marketing opportunity to expose them. And I would hope Ruth Blank would agree, expose the wonders of Comcast cable. And uh, keep your antenna on TV25, but take Comcast too. I mean, that we're, we're really, <laughs> We really honestly believe that the programming that we produce locally makes Comcast a stronger competitor against direct broadcast satellite and the other program uh, choices that viewers now have. So but that's my best shot at answering the difference answer. between that, Ron, and if Channel 25 came to you and said, you know, it's going to cost us uh, X dollars to, to go out and televise uh, that football game. And we know that you're going to go out and televise that football game, but our viewers don't get cable. Uh, and we think there's an audience for it. So we'll pay you X minus $1 to sell us your tape of that program. You couldn't do that, as I understand it. So, well, so what's, the again, what, what's the difference between that and exchanging programs? I, I, I really am sorry, because I, I <clears throat> I'm not a debater. Uh, that's not the way I process information, and I'm not an attorney. I uh, don't even play one on TV. Uh, so I, I really, in this moment, can't answer your question because I do see that there's a difference. I really honestly see a difference. The, uh, the other criteria that we haven't mentioned before is that, but I did put it in the written part, is that any use of our facilities shows on our channels. So it's really easy to witness whether we're up to some kind of skullduggery doing programming for hire uh, for purposes of generating revenue. Everything runs on our channels as it is seen anywhere else, on other nonprofit channels, or in this case, on the small I'm not worried about channels. skullduggery. I'm, I, I think Roger is on the right track about, about mission, but it's not necessarily the question that presents itself today. It's the question that presents itself a year from now or two years from now, and where, where does this take you? And I think that's the mm. reason that we're spending some time on it. Right. And yeah, and I'm, what I'm, I'm going to let you speak, oh. too, but I want to make an announcement, because I have to leave here at 4. I can't stay later than that. And I know that we've got <coughs> Kenneth Noel wishes to speak on this issue. <laughs> and uh, so I think we ought to hear from him uh, and his viewpoint. And uh, 
because uh, we're going to be under some time constraints, I'm afraid, in terms of losing uh, the, uh, the group. We appreciate this opportunity, and I think Thanks. it does show that the due process works. We thank you. Thanks. What I've got to... I, too, I'll be... Uh, let me uh, just come back here. Just yeah. go back and forth. What I tried to bring you from the staff perspective was, was take out the content issue, whether it's, it's in all of these topics, whether it's the Red Cross telephone, but more specifically here, whether the, the, the trade of game of the week for this basketball take that out the question i was trying to get from you was uh, is i think policy wise programming played on a commercial channel that has a tagline at the end that says this programming was produced by access sacramento with resources provided by the sacramento metropolitan cable television commission are you comfortable with with that 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 to me is the policy issue that public funds have worked their way over through lots of exchanges, but the tagline could raise the question to you, why are we doing this? And I want to be able to say to anyone who calls, if they call, maybe no one calls, or to you that we debated this on April Fool's Day of 1999 <laughs> and discussed it at length, reviewed the alternatives, looked at the options, considered it, and went this way with our policy direction. And, and the, the nature and content of the programming to me is not the issue because I think we could always I mean, that's a, that's a value judgment side that we're not supposed to be into. We, don't, we aren't supposed to be into the program content evaluation business. We're supposed to be in the broader policy. That's why we have the community grantee structure, is to separate you and insulate you. Okay. Mr. Noel. Thank you. I'm Kenneth Noel, Southwest Communication Service. And uh, he kind of touched on the access issue that you're, you're, you're trying to uh, dictate programming and that's a very slippery slope there and I'm not going <laughs> to go into that but uh, uh, last time I was here I talked about I was one of those producers that stood up here and said uh, we, we want to be very careful with this one and I, I kind of outlined it uh, in four points I think if, if someone comes to any government funded source to hire them to produce a program then I would oppose that because it takes it out of the market in, and in many cases, uh, you know, they could do it cheaper for multiple reasons. Um, basically, they're getting sub sub subsidized by government. Uh, if somewhere, someone were to lease the facility to produce a program to go out with it, I would have a problem with it. Uh, where I don't have a problem, where I think I'd like to see the policy, is where you have maybe a program that's innovative that's been produced by someone within the, these facilities or a non-served program that has been produced within these facilities uh, that is co-owned copyright by the producer and the facility that that producer and it's not the facility but it's the producer have an opportunity to go out and try and get more uh, other exposure uh, for their programming and that there be a potential revenue source there and that that revenue source be shared by the co copyright owners of the program. And those four areas that I'm talking about, um, you know, the two, the two that I would oppose were the higher and least facilities. The two I would support were, would be the, uh, an innovative program and a non-serve program. I think uh, Sac State basketball, because they can't win a game, is a non-serve <laughs> program at this point. No, no television station wants to air their, their, their programming because they can't get anybody to watch the game. And I'm a Sac State alumni. I'm a Hornet. <laughs> so uh, um, I think the Kings bordered in that, in that situation where 31 was having trouble finding sponsors. They start winning games. I think um, that's the bottom line is, is, is there's non-serve uh, programs like the basketball game that could have an opportunity to exchange. We're talking about you know, exchanging programs with uh, television stations who no longer are owned by anybody here. They're all corporate owned. There's no motivation for them to do local programming. There's no FCC obligation for them to do local programming. So from a producer standpoint, it's very, very, very hard to uh, get a program into a television station here. Uh, the, the economics of it are not there. Um, when, when you produce a lot of local programming with a local station like three, a lot of times they threw in the facilities, they threw in staffing, and you were able to do it. But uh, the, it's not locally owned. I see my time's running up. So um, that's basically the points I wanted to make as a producer, 
uh, and also as someone who was in the franchising process and kind of remember the, uh, the process of creating access and uh, what it really meant is giving people an opportunity for free speech uh, and an opportunity to provide programming that uh, they would not have an opportunity to pro get produced in any of the stations or, or local programs. Thank and you. I remember you from those days. I knew you were out there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Okay, now on item two, we had two speakers sign up, and that's on public opportunity to discuss matters not on this agenda, but within our jurisdiction. And Sue, you're up first. Thank you. I promise to get you out of here by four o'clock. <laughs> Madam Chair, and there one after you, so it's going to be tight. <laughs> I'll, I'll be very fast. Cable commissioners, staff, citizens watching today, I'm Sue Pearson Atkinson, Community Outreach Coordinator for Access Sacramento. And I have no slippery slopes to talk about. I bring good news only. And the good news is in the form of research that we undertook for Access Sacramento. It was conducted by a respected media market research firm called Group W to learn something about the Access Sacramento television viewing audience. Commercial stations do this all the time. We thought it was very important to know our audience better in light of some major challenges among them. A lack of anticipated funding levels, changing channel numbers, then high cable channel numbers. But this new research shows we have apparently overcome these challenges in ways that make us very proud and we think they'll make you very proud too. Remember we have a tiny, tiny promotions budget compared to commercial stations. Okay, bottom line is, the research shows access has become known to nearly 50% of the viewing audience interviewed and as many as 40,000 of them have watched particular programs. Some programming re reaches even more of our citizens. We certainly have never been in the business of monitoring ratings and market share, but it truly is wonderful news to know that so many people watch, know who we are and like what we do. The research shows that people feel access to programming meets their needs in response to those kinds of programming our citizens say they want to see. Local people, issues, events, people using their First Amendment rights, festivals, arts, local sports events, and all of this with no pressure for 15 second sound bites. <laughs> the research also shows that programming, while sometimes produced by newcomers to TV and radio mediums, not media professionals, is seen by our audience as meeting community standards for quality, content, language, and appropriateness. In other words, our viewers think that what they're watching is just fine. You don't have to take my word for any of this. We have the science to be able to show you all of this, how we're doing in this community. This is just a peek, just a heads up. You're going to get a full report on this market research in another month. We hope that you'll take some time to look it over. When you do, I think you'll agree even more than ever that Access is doing the job it was asked to do back in 1982 when we all of us as Sacramentans began this countywide, not town by town adventure. Thank you very much for letting me present this good news. And uh, it's not an April Fool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Best news of all. Yeah, best news of all. Okay, Mike Marmon, you're our last speaker, and I already know that your topic is televising regional transit on Channel 14, costs money, regional transit board refused to want to do it. They voted against doing it. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, well, but go ahead and try to <laughs> um, make your pitch. So. <laughs> anyway. Well, I know. I, I want him to know that, you know, that he's got to change votes up here on regional transit. Yes, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, my, my su subject of topic today is televising uh, regional transit. Uh, uh, it, was, it was brought up in early January. Uh, I advocated for a Citrus Heights resident uh, who had an issue about this and just the most recent board meeting, a uh, member of ECOS uh, got up and had addressed th this issue. Um, seems like transportation is, uh, is everly so more important uh, today with the uh, advent of T21. Uh, it was just discussed uh, most recently at City Council, we'll be coming back to the Board of Supervisors, and many people have the opportunity to see th that particular issue on TV because of the respective uh, board or council that it is uh, 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 appropriated to. Uh, but unfortunately, most people haven't had the opportunity to have regional transit televised. 
uh, one one issue which uh, I might uh, maybe ask a question here if uh, commissioners uh, would be interested. If regional transit would want to go to uh, conduct their meetings either in this chamber, Sacramento City Hall chamber, any other city council chamber within Sacramento County, or any brand new formed city uh, that, that comes up within the county. Would there be as much of a cost burden to that as opposed to the three free meetings at RT uh, after, after that? See, and I think Rich can answer that yeah. because we went through that. We had a, Michael and I had a long discussion of several hours ago. Uh, your, policies, your policies as now third year in your budget are quite clear. If an outside entity wishes to be cable cast on your nickel and, and they can meet in your city council or in this chamber, chamber. it will happen. You provide okay. funding for the first or for three meetings over a fiscal year on your nickel as well from an outside entity's location. Uh, so the only other cost issues and their minor ones, relatively speaking, have to do with security in the building if an outside entity decides to come here or come to city council. And we've used that as, you know, our Metro 14 motto is bringing government closer to the people. We do a fair amount of marketing. I'll say that, uh, you know, city schools meets in the city council chamber so it can be cable cast live. Uh, secondly, several of you have asked that, that we continue marketing with, with RT, and we've done that. We have a, a meeting with our staff and their staff set up now for the 14th. Okay. That answer, I, I know that when it was voted on at RT, it was both voted on not to move the location and not to pay to have it televised. And it has not been voted on in quite a while. So it will would, probably come up again, but that was a public vote, not would, to televise it and not to move it. Would the security cost be relatively small moving it to, say, this chamber versus uh, only holding it at their own house chamber? Let us address that with staff when we meet with them, but the, the security costs are relatively small. If you hold a meeting here and the building would otherwise be closed, that entity must pay for the guard. And I believe that's uh, operating policy of both facilities. But that's not big dollars in the scope of the RT budget. Okay. I'd Let be, staff address that for you. I'd be interested in looking further into that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Mike. Okay. That is the end of our... We uh, have one more speaker. Arthur Ketterling. This up? I don't have it. We have Cooper, Noel. Here we go, Arthur. Okay, Arthur. Arthur, you were on this one. Hi, sorry yeah. about that. I misplaced it myself. I, I didn't know how 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 to put the title on there, but it has to do with uh, alternative. Ron, Rick was uh, meant mentioned briefly about alternative programming over the access uh, stations. If uh, are, I would like to ask, isn't that meaning paid half paid half hour commercials? If it is, I wouldn't want it. There's a lot. There's a lot of them. There, a lot of them already. We need the our public access as of the programming and we need like like things to continue like like our like our meetings on oh on 14 or whatever number you'll be on or in the future or etc i don't know what the plans is i know we're just getting up starting to get off the ground with digital but if you have any uh, plans at all to have more, I'm just saying more than one metro station, like say, as an example, like a digital or, or whatever, maybe down the line, that then uh, say like, for instance, like, uh, like there would be a meeting that like would be live, like we would see it, basically at a one part of the end on one station, but yet like it would it wouldn't be shown on the other and et cetera. But you know, as far as like showing different things, like it would be live on on that, but it would be seen like maybe later on or to the I hope you know what I'm trying to 
Right. To say, <laughs> Miss Collins and we all understand. of you, yeah. like say like Citrus Heights, for instance, or your meeting, duh, as far as like it would be shown and all, and but you would have like program your own programming on 14 or, and but we would see see the excuse me, see the others see that on, on, on your other station and et cetera. Okay, our, I, I will ask one question because I think you're talking about with, the, with, uh, with multiple being uh, available on digital, can we do multiple ones for, we only have the one channel. I know. You. And so we have, our, our repeats have to come over that channel. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah. I don't know with multiple channels oh. whether the cable company itself would want us to have multiple meetings going on. We can get at this uh, at the budget time. I don't think there's yeah. enough market penetration yet on the digital service that would warrant going to Comcast and talking about trading. Right. Down the road a bit there might be, but it's still early yet. Okay, thanks Arthur, very all much. Right, all right, thanks. and now as just one thing, I just wanted to say, I please, I don't no, 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 none of those. I uh, like just access and I, what you've been doing and all. Only one thing that I do don't see on educational programming, or I mean not educational, but on Ron's uh, station, 73 and 4, that is that we, I would like to see Little League uh, <laughs> uh, come, come on the station at least Thanks, once Arthur. in a while. <laughs> Thanks, Arthur. That's a good way to end. A good way. With three grandsons playing it, how could you ever choose? <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to go ahead. This meeting is adjourned. Do you want to adjourn to the 13th? Before we adjourn, uh, do you want to adjourn to the 13th? Or do you want to see if you want a special meeting? Uh, let's wait and see if we need the special meeting. Okay. Well, uh, uh, and before we formally announce adjournment, I am going to adjourn this to May 13th. Uh, and that way we have the ability, if we don't need it, to cancel it. Okay. May 13th? Yes, adjourned to May 13th. Same topic. Oh, good.